Hey guys, Andrew Huberman explains how to fix your lazy eye. You should watch this video. Let's listen to Andrew Huberman, a tenured professor in the Department of Neurobiology at Stanford University School of Medicine. He provides useful information about binocular vision and lazy. I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. Talk about binocular vision and lazy eye. I'm very familiar with lazy eye because when I was a kid, I went swimming one day, one day, and I didn't have my goggles. And so something must have been happening, as I recall, with the eye moving down through the water. I've always had this problem that I can only do the freestyle stroke off to one side. The people I swim with are always laughing. Uh, somehow I, I kind of move toward drowning when I try and breathe on the right side. I think there's some asymmetry in the way I'm organized. Anyway, I was off to my left and my eye kept going in and out of the water and there was chlorine in the water and it was making my eye uncomfortable. So I just closed my eye. I just decided, you know, knew more or less how to swim straight-ish. Might have bounced off the lane lines a few times, but I just used the other eye to kind of steer for that mark on the wall. Got out of the pool, took a shower, tried off, and then completely lost binocular vision for three days. Completely. The young brain up until about age seven, but maybe even extending out until about age 12, is extremely vulnerable to differences in ocular input between the two eyes. My scientific great-grandparents won the Nobel Prize for discovering so-called critical periods, periods of time in which the brain is more plastic, more able to change. Those two guys, David Hubel, Torrenson Weasel, thank you, David and Torrenson, forever change the face of visual neuroscience and forever change the way we think about treatment of the young brain. It used to be thought that you wouldn't want to do a surgery on a young kid because of risk of anesthesia in young individuals. But we now know that you need to repair these imbalances that even a few hours, okay, I don't want to scare anybody, I'll talk about reversal, but a few hours of occluding one eye early in life can lead to permanent, unless something's done, permanent changes in the way that the brain perceives the outside world, such that when that eye is opened up again, the brain actually can't make sense of anything that's coming through it. It shuts down that visual pathway somehow. So what happened to me was, I actually was, my eye was fine. I got out of the pool, I opened my eye, but I couldn't see through that eye. Everything was blurry, double vision, unless I covered this eye, and then I could see perfectly fine. Fortunately, I went to an ophthalmologist who understood the literature. Thank you, Dr. Mark Lurie, who understood the literature and made clear that what I needed to do was to occlude the other eye, the eye that was working very well. Clearly, he understood the work of Hubel and Weasel. Now, again, you don't want to start playing games with this kind of stuff when you're a kid. If you wear, let's say you have a Halloween costume and you wear an eye patch, you're a pirate or something for Halloween, and you cover it up on one side, probably for the night of Halloween, it's okay. I do not recommend doing that recreationally if you don't need that, if you're a young child or for your child to do that, because indeed you create imbalances in the brain machinery that compares information coming in through the two eyes and it can shut down the neural information for the occluded, the closed eye. My binocular vision isn't great as a consequence of this early event. And I have a hard time with those um, binocular stereograms, those images that are kind of, you're supposed to look at them and then the binocular depth image like pops out. People, all the other kids were going, oh, there's the whatever, the Statue of Liberty, there's the American, and I see, I see dots, okay? So I have binocular vision, but I use other cues. I use the near-far cues that I talked about before. Motion parallax, the fact that things are closer to me are moving faster than things further away in order to judge depth. And years later when I got involved in, and I don't suggest this for most people, um, I got involved in boxing and martial arts when I was younger. You, you, sometimes we'll see fighters, this is a slip to avoid getting punched. It's also generating motion parallax. Many animals judge depth by moving their head, not by using other mechanisms of accommodation. Okay, so uh, a lot of birds and monkeys and animals will judge depth by moving their head like this, or they'll move from side to side. Animals that will undulate sometimes are actually doing a depth measurement because as you move from side to side, the brain is able to do the math of depth. So what does this all mean in terms of protocols? If you're a young person, do your best to get really good binocular vision, not just at level of your phone or your tablet, but also at distance. You will build strong binocular visual machinery in the brain and at the level of the eyes and the eye musculature. Now, if you're somebody who did have an occlusion, what's needed is to cover up the other eye, to create an imbalance so that the weak eye, the so-called lazy eye, this is sometimes referred to as amblyopia, that eye has to work harder. So for me, they patched this other eye and made this eye, eventually I got vision through that eye back, then they opened them both up. Now, you might ask, what happens if you cover both eyes early in life? And this is where it gets interesting. You might think, well, if covering one eye leads to poor vision, for that eye, after that eye is open, covering both eyes would probably make you blind, right? Actually, 
That's not what happens. What Hubel and Wiesel discovered and what's been affirmed many, many more times over in subsequent studies is that it's competitive, that the two eyes are competing for real estate up in the brain. So if you actually cover both eyes, you actually extend the period of, the, of critical plasticity. This is a really interesting aspect that other people are starting to leverage now in terms of how to reopen plasticity later in life. But please don't, uh, you know, go around with your eyes covered for too long. There are some like retreats and stuff where people go into caves with absolutely no vision. Here's my suggestion. Try and get balanced visual input through the two eyes. Almost everybody has a dominant eye. It usually doesn't relate to your dominant hand, although it can. And so for me, if I cover up my right eye, I see much less well, much more poorly. It's a little bit fuzzy and I have to work harder in order to see the camera, for instance. Then if I cover up my left eye, it's actually really easy for me to relax. I have a dominant eye. Okay? You can balance that out by covering up the dominant eye a little bit each day. But I would warn any young people, meaning uh, you know, 12 or younger, against creating these imbalances if there isn't a clinical need to do that. And if you do have strong imbalances between the two eyes, which can be caused by cataract and lens issues, can be uh, caused by neuromuscular issues, etc., to try and get those dealt with as early as possible by contacting a really good ophthalmologist and ideally a neuro-ophthalmologist. I've been doing eye exercises since I was in my 20s because I noticed when I would study a lot, this eye would start to drift in. I'd start to see double and, I would, and then next thing you know, I was just covering the eye up. It was getting weaker and weaker, just like the atrophy of a muscle. So I went to the doctor. What did they do? They did the exact wrong thing. The optometrist I went to gave me a prism, which adjusted it so that I could see things normal which just made the eye weaker and weaker. It's like putting a weak arm into a sling. So I had to spend at least three years of 10 minutes a day, is what I recommend, doing near far, just bringing something in close. You'll feel the strain of your eyes doing that. I can feel it right now. Move it out. You'll feel a relaxation point. Move it past that relaxation point where you will have to do what's called a virgin side movement to maintain focus on that location as it moves out. Bring it back in. At the point where you actually have to go cross-eyed, this will differ for different people depending on how far apart your eyes are, so-called interpupillary distance. The point at which things get blurry and cross-eyed will vary, covering up my good eye, doing near far with my bad eye, and now it's been about 10, 12 years that I have pretty decent binocular vision. Now, many of you aren't dealing with this <laughs> um, or have these early childhood issues. Some of you might be experiencing challenges with fatigued eyes or with differences in focus with the two eyes. These eye exercises of near, far, smooth pursuit and checking for for dominant and non-dominant eye can be very beneficial. I'm Again, I'm not a clinician, so I don't want to you know, give you protocols or enforce protocols on anybody. You need to figure out what's right and safe for you, given your vision history. I do recommend talking to a really good ophthalmologist if you have severe vision problems of any kind or if you want to offset vision problems of any kind. An optometrist uh, as well, but ideally it would be a neuro-ophthalmologist.